Let's spend a few minutes introducing uh, supply and demand and the behavior of markets. In economics, more and more around the world, we're seeing that uh, free market economics, capitalism, is, is a dominant field. It's proving pretty workable. And in order to appreciate that and, uh, and analyze it, we need to understand the basic terms and the basic concepts of how markets work. Supply and demand, quick overview, okay? What we're going to look at is two variables. In this case, the quantity of a product. Now, this may mean the number of units you buy, or it may mean the number of units that I try to sell, but it's the quantity of units out there, number of slices of pizza, number of hamburgers, and the price of that product. What's the price of hamburgers? And we're going to see that with respect to buyers, the demand side, we'll say that when the prices are very high, if hamburgers are selling for $10 a piece, we shouldn't expect to sell very many. They're a little expensive. People have alternative uses for their money. And so at $10, we might find in our restaurant or whatever that we only sell five hamburgers per day. But if we experiment, we might learn that when we reduce the price of hamburgers down, let's say, to $5, we might sell, and I'm making up a number here, right? We might sell 31 hamburgers per day. Now, let's plot those two points. $10 and 5 units would give us a point up here at A. And at $5, we would sell 31 units. That would give us a point up here at point B. Okay? And so, if we plotted different prices and how much people would buy for each price, at each price, we would get a basically negative sloped relationship. If we plotted those points and we fit a line to them, we would get something that's got basically a negative slope. Now, the slope may be very steep, it may be very flat, okay, but it's still going to be negative. That's what we call the demand curve or the demand function or just a, a two-dimensional representation of buyer behavior. In common sense, when things are cheaper, people buy more of it, not rocket science. So we get a negative sloped demand curve. Critical to us in our terminology is to say this way, two things. First, we always look at the price first and then say, what will that do to the quantity people buy? We don't look at it the other way. We don't say, well, if the quantity is this, then the price would, would be that. No. Read it this way. If the price is some level, then people will buy so much. This is called the independent variable. It changes first. And this is the dependent variable. It becomes whatever value based on what this one does. So that's the first part. Now, if you go from this point to this point along the demand curve, you're moving along the demand curve. We do not call that a change in demand. And, and the distinction here is going to be important. We say that if the price drops, then the number that people buy changes. And we say it this way. This would be a change, delta sign is change, right? A change in the quantity demanded. That's not the same thing as a change in demand. A change in quantity demanded occurs when the price changes for that product. A change in quantity demanded is reflected as movement along the demand curve. Now contrast that to something else. Suppose, for example, that in, uh, in this restaurant, that this was the demand curve on weekdays, Monday through Friday. But that on weekends, people came into town, we had more customers, things were busy, activities going on, fairs, and sports events. Suppose that on Saturdays and Sundays, if we charged $10, we would, re we would sell, making up a number here, 29 hamburgers a day. And on Saturday and Sunday, if we charged $5, we would sell Oh, some number out here. Let's call it 46 hamburgers a day. 
Well, now we've got two points out here. We'll call them C and D. And they're on a different demand curve. It's going to go out here kind of like that. No, I'm not good with crayons, okay? But it's still that negative slope. Well, what's going on? Well, what's going on is this is the demand for hamburgers during the week, but the demand for hamburgers changes over the weekend. And so we have a new demand function or a new demand relation out, relationship out here. So this would be the demand curve for Saturday and Sunday. Now, what do we mean by a change in demand? Instead of change in quantity demanded, a change in demand means the entire demand curve moves. There's a new demand curve at work. In this case, it's an increase. Anytime the curve shifts to the right, it's an increase because that means at any price you were charging, you're now selling more. Okay? So you could have an increase in demand or you could have conceivably a decrease in demand. Maybe this is the Tuesday, Wednesday crowd. I don't know. Okay? But the demand curve can be, and in fact, is constantly in flux. It's going to be increasing at times and decreasing at times. And one of the things we have to really get a grip on is what is it that makes the demand curve increase or decrease? So to go through that very quickly, because we'll do it in a little more depth at some other point, what are the five things we use? I use five of them. What five forces shift the demand curve? So very quickly. Force number one, the number of buyers. When you have more buyers for a product, you have an increase in demand. Okay? If a sports team's uh, logo and, and uh, paraphernalia becomes popular, more people are buying it. Second thing, very closely related to this, would be the uh, tastes and preference of the buyers. And this would, again, be things like fads. If blue jeans get popular, if shorts get popular, whatever, some kind of particular brand. And then also, um, fairly closely allied with that, would be any change in buyers' expectations. If, for example, you read that eating tomatoes prevents cancer, would you start eating more tomatoes? Well, maybe not you personally, but a lot of people would. So a change in their expectations would cause them to buy more tomatoes, whatever their price. So those three are pretty, pretty closely interrelated. Uh, they're not necessarily separate. They can all be working at the same time. Here's the other two, though. Uh, force number four that can shift a demand curve, make it increase or make it de decrease, depending on what happens. Incomes. Let's use the letter M for income, okay? If people's income goes up, most of the time, their demand for products increases. They have more money, they buy more steak. They have more money, they buy more automobiles. They have more money, they buy more all kinds of stuff. This is normal behavior. This is what normally happens. We call these normal goods. Most goods are normal. That's the way people normally behave. But can you think of a product or a service that if you had more money, you would buy less of it? Your, de your demand would decrease. And a couple of examples, one of them is uh, ramen noodles. If you're in college and you're on a slim budget, you're probably living on a lot of ramen noodles. If you've got more money, would you go out and buy more ramen noodles? I, I'm thinking not, right? Or generic products. People typically go to generic store brand products because they're cheaper. And they often are forced to do that as their incomes fall. So look at this. There are times when your income will rise and you will buy less of a product. Your demand for that product will decrease. Generic goods. If you had more money, you might buy the popular brands. These types of goods, we use the term, we call them inferior. Inferior goods. It says nothing about their quality, okay? It says something about the way buyers behave when they get a change in their income. With inferior goods, when they enjoy more money, they buy less of them and turn it around. If their income falls, they start buying more ramen noodles or whatever, generic products, okay? So these are the five forces that can shift the demand curve, and you need to understand those and recognize them when you read them in an article in the paper or hear about them on the news, all right? That's demand. Let's don't stop now. Let's talk about the supply side just for a second because we have to put all this stuff together, and we're doing this kind of quick right now.
but just as an overview.